I have three questions. Number one, I didn't even know about this, but maybe. It says, Robbie D. been released following his arrest. I didn't even know he was arrested. Well, as, once again, the power of the Internet, um, a lot of people uh, made a big deal out of it. Uh, Robbie went to visit a friend of his in Canada over Thanksgiving week, had an argument. Um, she called the police and said some things that he uh, was alleged to have done. Here, here's my legal speak that uh, was blown up out of proportion, and because it was Thanksgiving weekend and he was an out-of-country resident, before they could do paperwork to release him, they had to leave him sitting there for a while. And they're not exactly the brightest country as a whole, to be honest with you. Now we get all kinds of calls from Ken. <laughs> um, and so, you know, now he's back home, and I think there's uh, it's going to be uh, no more bother to him. I think it'll all be straightened out. Okay, have you thought about bringing in some veterans to uh, help uh, work some matches with some of your younger guys? And he brought up two names that if you were thinking of this, you probably would think of, and that's Bobby Eaton and Tommy Rogers. Um, well, absolutely. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, I've been talking to Bobby, um, you know, on and off, and probably the only reason he hasn't been here so far has just been because it's been uh, a screwy holiday schedule for us and we had everything all planned out. But after the first of the year, I would love to have Bobby come up and uh, and, and have classes and matches with these guys. I think that would be a tremendous help. Uh, Tommy Rogers would be fabulous, too, because I always loved his – uh, you know his style, and he's an excellent teacher. Uh, but he's, uh, you know, he's still wrestling uh, somewhat professionally in terms of uh, not anxious to come and be a trainer more, uh, more out there on the road. So, you know, it might happen. Uh, also, he wants to know uh, when can we expect to see Smoky Mountain videos for sale on the website? Um, somebody asked me this last time, and I said soon, and now it's even sooner because I actually have a Christmas vacation. I might be able to get that done by then. Okay. Uh... This is a funny one. I don't know why. I, I read this, and I started laughing at this question. It says, this is from Tony Vicencio, who goes, is it true that you and Shawn Michaels don't like each other, or is that just another Internet rumor? <laughs> it's just another silly Internet rumor. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, uh, let's see. This is from JP in San Francisco, who says, the promo you gave in Smoky Mountain Wrestling when you said goodbye to the Heavenly Bodies after losing a Loser League Town match against the Rock and Roll Express stands out as one of my favorite promos of all time. The way you went down the history of your feud with Ricky Morton was something wrestlers today should pay attention to when building hype to, for upcoming matches. My question is, did you give that promo to add shock value to your managing the Rock and Roll Express soon after, or was that just a reflection of the career and character of Jim Cornette, the manager? Um, actually, I just thought it really summed things up at the moment, and it was a cool thing to say. <laughs> you know, that that was really what it was. It just brought, because that was uh, when the bodies were headed to the WWF uh, from Smoky Mountain. They lost a loser leave town, and we were in the hallway of the the arena where it happened and, and uh, uh, you know, did the uh, the promo. Like we'd come out of the commissioner's office trying to appeal, and it was fruitless, and, and they were gone. And I cut the promo, and it just seemed like that brought the story to a close. And then they turn, and they, they walk down the hall. And do you remember seeing it? What was the sappy music that we played? God, I just I forgot. Um, I, 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 I do uh, remember it. Bob Seger, the famous final scene. Famous final scene, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and they're walking down the hall, and and I stop about halfway, and they keep on walking, and right before we go to black, Jimmy Del Rey kind of turns and looks over his shoulder at me, and has a tear in his eye, and they turn their heads and hang their heads and go out the door, and that's the end of it. And it's you know the sappy music and everything. It was just cool. <laughs> so that's that was we did it. That was that was a really awesome. Piece of TV. I remember that now. Now you brought that up. And it uh, it cost us um, about 15 minutes and and a blank tape to produce. <laughs> so you know it was especially cool because of that. This is from uh, Todd Martin. It's not for you, Jim. There's there's a couple of questions I wanted to get to before we started taking phone calls. Okay. It says in the in the Written Observer this week you referred to Jim Ross having a very short stint as an amateur wrestling announcer, which led to a panic and voiceovers being done before it aired. I've never heard this story. What's this all about? Um, do you remember the story, Jim, by any chance? Um, faintly. I, I remember okay. him doing the Falcons. I don't remember this, I don't think. Okay, this would have been early 90s, um, probably prior to the Goodwill Games. I think they had some series on TBS, which was like, um, where they would go through like Olympic sports and have like, you know, major meets from the Olympic sports, kind of as a way to build up the Olympics. Um, I forget what it was called. But anyway, uh, Jim Ross got the job of of announcing. Um, I think it was a national amateur championship meet, but it's a, it was a it was a major amateur meet. He did the announcing; everything was fine. And before it aired, people in the actually actually right after it, uh, Jim Ross, I believe, did it with Russ Hellickson, who was a very famous amateur wrestler from um, I think in the maybe late sixties, early seventies. 
And, you know, everything was fine there. Then after Jim Ross left, um, everyone was just like, oh, my God, that's Jim Ross, the pro wrestling announcer. And, you know, amateur wrestling people still <laughs> hate, hate pro wrestling. And it was just like, it, it had nothing they, they to do must, with whether... They must hate good announcing, too. <laughs> Well, I don't think I don't think that the quality of the announcing ever was an issue. It was just that this pro wrestling announcer came and did it, and people like freaked. And when the thing finally aired, which was like you know six weeks later, and there was lots of controversy during that period, I remember sitting down to watch the thing, um, just because I was kind of curious as how Jim Ross would do doing amateur wrestling, and you know just because I wanted to see the show. And lo and behold, Jim Ross was not on the show, and they had an announcer who did voiceovers who was not. You know, they never showed like any. Scenes of him like actually there, and they showed, <laughs> so he was edited all, completely out of the tape. Yeah, I think so. that guy just wanted clarification that it was just because he was a pro wrestling announcer, not anything wrong with the announcing. Because when I first read that, I thought, "What the hell was wrong with his announcing?" And then I remember that story. So that's so silly to remove someone who did a good job at something just because they do something else you don't like. Well, the the the, the reason that they removed that they used for removing him, okay, was that they claimed that he was trying to recruit, and I believe it was Bruce Baumgartner, although I could be wrong about the wrestler, into pro wrestling, and the amateur people were mad. Okay. And I don't think that any of that was, was... I mean, I have no doubt he probably went up to him and was talking to him and may have, you know, may have thrown in something like, you know, have you ever thought about pro wrestling, which is a natural question, and the guy said no, and like, you know, then all of a sudden it's like, He's out here trying to steal our, you know, steal our talent. Well, well, Lord, we can't have these guys, you know, out there training their whole life and actually get paid for it. <laughs> so. at, some, at some point. Uh, that's one, let's see. This is also uh, from John Spratt, who's talking about last night's CCW show, and he goes, did it sell out? Yes, it did. Uh, how many seats does the ballroom have? He goes, I'm assuming 3,500. It was about 25, 2,600. I don't know the exact number, but that's the CCW show at the Hammerstein Ballroom. And the next pay-per-view will be from the same location on January 7th. This is from John Mazuku. Who goes with Jim? That, who were they chanting "You sold out to" last night? Jerry Lynn. Oh, was it? Who's, who's still with the company? I know. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but hell, he just sold out anyway. But, 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 but he did. He did go and, and ask for a job uh, Tuesday with uh, WWF. So he was chanting Those, in the ballroom. You know, you can't you can't have these guys training all their life and expect to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I got to say that the, the "You sold out" chance at ECW. Are so lame. I, I mean, they are so lame, and especially it, they're they're lame under any circumstances. Okay, but under these circumstances, to chant that at Jerry Lynn, as hard as that guy has worked in that company for the last two three years, is is just so sad. I mean, uh, why? I don't I mean, want to get in. You have to not get paid before you're not selling out. But it's even it's just not even that. I mean, if, if he, you can get a better job elsewhere. You know, that's, that's, that's really good, and I think they should be really happy that this guy worked so hard for them because, I mean, if it was some guy who was like, like let's just let's throw out a guy who's lazy, Kevin Nash, okay? I haven't picked on him in like a day, all right? Kevin Nash, who did nothing for, for like three years, four years in WCW, collected this giant paycheck, kind of like uh, manipulated the whole dressing room to where the whole company's a total disaster, all right? And then he goes to WWF, Let's say when his contract's up in a year or whenever the thing is up, okay? If those fans chanted, you sold out, you sold out, they would be wrong. But they wouldn't, but I wouldn't be nearly, you know, but the, the situation, at least, <laughs> at least they could say, you know, you ruined our company. <laughs> well, you know, we had this money and, 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 and all that and, and, and more power ship. to it. Okay? And you, then you abandon ship, okay? But with Jerry, I mean, it's like this guy worked so hard and didn't get paid, a lot, you know, a, a lot of weeks. And I mean, if he can, if he can get a job somewhere, more power to him. And they should be happy that 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 they got to see all those great matches that Jerry Lynn delivered for him. W wouldn't it be better if, uh, let's say, for example, let's let's pull a wild idea out of thin air. If the promotion uh, made it clear from the start that yes, uh, we enjoy it when our talent is picked to go to the <laughs> to the biggest stage in wrestling and make a ton of money, because that shows that. That our guys not only have what it takes to hang with the big boys, but get you know get chosen up to worldwide stardom, and and we foster that environment instead of uh, creating the environment where the people will chant, "You sold out, you sold out." Wouldn't that be beneficial to that smaller promotion? I'm just wondering, just <laughs> just a screwy idea. This is from John Mozuk. Would Jim Cornette take the job as the autonomous head of World Championship Wrestling with 100% full control, and if so? What would he do to change the product to make it better? Um, 
two-part question. Number one, yes, I would. I would take the autonomous control, and then I would promptly sell everything of value in the warehouse, pocket the cash, and bail out of town under cover of darkness. <laughs> Uh, to make the product better, I would suggest an acetylene torch and a can of gasoline. Um, <laughs> so that's the only really fair way I can answer that question. But there is profit to be made up because I figure if you just got in the warehouse and sold the rings alone, you'd come up with fifteen or twenty grand you could take off with. <laughs> so right there, I've changed a sixty million dollar loss to a twenty thousand dollar profit. <laughs> okay, let's go to Phil in DC. Phil, what's going on? Hey everybody. Hey. Um, I. Uh... What a couple wanted to make a comment and then a quick question for uh, Jim. I went to the Omega Reunion show this weekend, and they probably had the best ECW title defense I've seen in maybe two years. Oh, the with uh, with uh, Steve Carino against Champagne, it was really cool. I think you would have liked to watch it. It was very southern. Oh yeah, and I know both those guys. Uh, they they work their ass off too. Yeah, it was. Very, I mean, it was a lot of like punches and kicks. It actually, reminded me like of a Lawler, um, a Lawler like uh, Buddy Van Dell match or something like that where, like, all the transitions were punches and the crowd was really into it. Like, it was the opposite of the crowd at the pay-per-view. Like, the crowd, the crowd of that show was smaller, but they were, like, super into everything everybody did. And that's, a, that's a difference in geography. Yeah, it was a great, you know, so much better. I mean, I'm from, I'm from the West Coast originally, but I live in the North, but I love going to wrestling shows in the South because you don't have, you know, you don't have people with stupid chants and, you know, you know, trying to get them, fans are trying to get themselves over at the expense of what's going on. They're just really into the matches. Yeah, we, we try to sell the fans down here tickets to the seats instead of uh, tickets into the ring to be part of the show. But it works out better for that because it makes the fans work less hard to enjoy the show, and it makes us work less hard to be able to live to have another show. Yeah, and it's more fun with, uh, you know, it's more fun to be a fan of a show like that because, you know, just get into the, you know, cheer for the baby face, prove for the bad guy. I don't know, if, any of you guys ever seen a gimmick of a guy named uh, Lazarus? He works at NWA Wildside, and he uh, was at that show. He's got probably the funniest gimmick I've ever seen in like all all the wrestling I've watched from around. I have not seen that. I just got a bunch of Wild Side tapes, and I actually have not seen him. But he's been on the tapes that I have, and I probably will end up seeing him within the next week or two. But I know, I know he's finishing. Is he the one with the finishing movie that's called the Britney Spears? Yeah, he does a Britney Spears gimmick with like the full on uh, ponytails and the whole outfit, and he comes out to the song and does the dance. And it's absolutely hysterical. I don't and, and, really and, and, like no, comedy. So, so, so tell, tell me about tell me, his, no, his finisher. He does a spear and he ends up like in the missionary position. Is yeah, that missionary. It? The Britney spear. <laughs> the Britney spear. And he has the missionary position. Right, he, does, and he does a lap dance to the security guard. So he's oh, like, it sounds it, like it's tailor made for me. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the dance sounds like old Smokey Mountain. Give him, pick him up and take him to the Live Valley. He kind of worked, too. He did a really nice uh, toping on Eo from the top rope to the floor in this little three way match he had. And I swear, it's absolutely two. hysterical. I've couldn't stop laughing. He's a baby face, which I don't think I've ever I mean, you see a, a guy who's doing a gay gimmick as a baby face in the South. It's just so weird. But, you know, he was a complete baby face. I don't know if that, I can't think of it. You're a, you're, you guys are both wrestling historial, historical experts. Has there ever been a, a guy doing an outwardly gay gimmick who's worked as a baby face before? Adrian Street, Adrian, Adrian Street turned, and turned in several territories. Okay. Yeah, Adrian was a great baby face because uh, once that he, he, you know, uh, stopped doing the overtly, you know, um, heel getting stuff, and tried to uh, try to tone it down a little bit. And then, he, then they got to where they liked it because he was funny, and he'd pinch well, the referee's ass and they'd laugh. You know, gold, gold us too. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. And once he's around long enough for everybody to get familiar, then it's like, you know, we get a kick out of that guy. Yeah, I think I, I, always, I always saw that Pimpinella, who this guy actually reminded me of, always was. But you never see a lot of hate from him. From the Mexican crowd, I went to a lot show live in Mexico. No, he's, he he's, he's and the he's crowd just like him. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a real. He puts on a real entertaining show, and he's a super. I mean, I don't know how, what he's like now because it's. I haven't gone, it's probably seen him wrestle live in five years. But I mean, when I used to watch him, I mean, he was a very talented worker. Oh, he's a great worker. I saw him. Uh, I saw some tapes of him down in IWRG maybe. I don't know. Six months ago, he was he was awesome. He was, he was a mat wrestling match against the Vianos. So he took it right to the mat with like Viano four, and they did all kinds of really quick uh, counters and things like that. It, it was it was real. I, I really had a tough time with him though the first time I saw him because Jim is like this guy, this guy like he he dresses like in a women's bathing suit. And, I mean, he looks so much like a woman, and and you know and he can go. I mean, he can go on the uh, on the mat and and wrestle. And he's a very good yeah, worker. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> but it's just so freaky. The first, the first thing you're just going like, you know, this is just too weird looking, that you don't know what to make of it, and then, then it like freaks you out the worst because he actually is a really good worker. Yeah. And, the, and the cool thing about him, and I think also Lazarus, which is what I heard, is that it's legit. Like both guys are, aren't, you know, straight guys playing 
gay characters, yeah. actual gay yeah. guys doing the stuff, which I think I, is kind I, of cool. I always, I got, I always got that impression with Pimpinella. What? I, was got, I always got that impression with Pimpinella. I've seen Pimpinella. I actually was a backstage. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. That's enough. 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 That's Jim, you did a lot, because I was thinking about this, Lazarus. What did, you did a lot of angles in Smoky Mountain, and a lot of them were really great, and some of them worked. What do you think was, like, your biggest, you know, one that you thought might look good in the, out in front and then come out, came out when you actually put it on TV and ended up being terrible? Oh, I think it would have to be The Mummy. Yeah. I think oh, The Mummy is the classic. Bad. But you know what? I actually like it now because it was so bad and did flop so good that uh, <laughs> it was just fun, you know. Here's The Mummy out there cutting his fingers off and sand's falling out of him, and people are going... <sighs> You know, <laughs> so actually, I enjoyed it after that. Yeah. Uh, okay. That was that was the question I had. Good talk, you guys. Go, Jim, Go, we gotta get ready. Your stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Dave, I gotta say one thing. Yes. How the mighty have fallen. We have just followed up an entire segment on a discussion of gay slash transvestite wrestlers by plugging a program called Jockle Doodle Do. <laughs> it's a sad day. <laughs> <laughs> now you got me. The, the, our new website. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I was going to make mention. For some reason, it must be harder to find the poll question. So everyone, find that poll question. <laughs> it wasn't yeah, harder for pimple on the, the no, poll uh, yeah, on the on the the auto website. Yeah, not on our website. The poll question is right there on the right. I can I can find that without looking for it. Dave, uh, the, uh, on the new website, if you go to guest on the right hand side, the poll question is under the guest folder. Okay, the poll question is now under the guest folder for those of you who used to be voting every day and haven't found it. Okay, just want to make mention because... Well, who left it there? Damn it, they should pick up after themselves. They left the question under the guest folder. Okay, this is, um... There's something here. Is there ever, every once in a while you just lose complete control of one of these, don't you? The show? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like uh, last week with uh, Vampiro and Violent Shea, which is actually something I wanted to read right now. But, okay, this is uh, from, this is, uh, could you ask Mr. Cornette of his impressions of Rob Van Dam and his chances of going to the WWF? Uh, my impression of Rob Van Dam athletically is that he is amazing. He's fabulous. All, all the stuff that he does is, you know, he defies gravity. Um, I'm not sure that he's an all-around worker that can, can you know, do any style, I guess is what I'm trying to say, because I've seen him have some stinker matches with some, some guys that couldn't go like that. Um, personally, I don't know Rob very well, but I know that, uh, you know, he did have one appearance at a WWF television where he was waiting on Paulie to tell him everything to do and, and uh, you know, didn't want to really do what was laid out, and it was kind of silly, and I don't know whether or not that I, maybe sometimes a guy needs a place where he can be the guy. Rather than one of the guys, you know that may be my impression. Or you know, and he does movies too. Does he want to wrestle or act, or how how committed is he to one or both? I, it, I don't know. You know, I don't know much about Rob. It's a real interesting little deal there because, you know, he he was the number one guy in ECW, and you know he, you know he's owed money and he's kind of sitting out right now, and I'm not sure where that all stands and as far as going somewhere. It's like even though he's the number one guy in ECW, as far as like prospects for WF and WCW, he's probably not anywhere close to the number one guy. Either of those companies, if they really knew what they were looking for, would pick off of that roster. Not saying that you couldn't use him because harnessed correctly, he could be valuable to either company. Yeah. But but again, there's a lot. But the uh, the Rob Van Dam match that does in ECW, he's really not going to have the freedom to do uh, because a lot of the guys aren't going to take that. Like that Van Terminator move. Yeah, that, all like, the top guys. You know those top guys are going to take that move. You have to understand, like, you can do it. He can do the move, but no one's going to sit there with that chair in front of their face while he kicks you from 20 feet in the air <laughs> and gives you a bloody nose or something, or, or whatever, you know, whatever and, it, and you know, that move entails. And, you know, here's an idea. If, if uh, there was any credibility involved, would you still be standing there after he flew from 20 feet away, or would you have sidestepped and said, hey, you know, um, I think that that's more of a performance match than a, than a match match. I'd at least yeah. move the chair. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd move my whole damn body, thank you. Um, you know, it, I mean, it, there's sometimes you can get away with milking, going to the top and coming off with a splash and everything, and people's attention are diverted, etc. But, you know, that's that's why I just can't get into a lot of that when, when guys are, are staggering around waiting for somebody to come from 40 feet away and, and can't get out of the way in time. Uh, I used to... Yeah. 
that used to kill me in the, in the Sabu matches. And in fact, when Sabu went to All Japan, I remember watching the tapes, and those fans would like laugh at those spots. I mean, just like absolutely, you hear the whole crowd laugh, laughing. Certainly, that's not the reaction that he was looking for, because the guy has to lay there on the table forever for him to set the spot up. Yeah, it's like if, if in the World War II movies, if the Japanese soldiers were jumping up out of the uh, the bunker and standing there waiting for John Wayne to shoot him, you know, it wouldn't have made as exciting a movie. I think anyway. there's a WCW hardcore match when someone throws a garbage can at someone from like five feet away, and they still miss. <laughs> <laughs> This is this got is from, a lot of nearsighted guys that never played baseball down there. <laughs> this is from Harry, who goes, I love the Vampiro uh, comedy jam show. Is there any way you can put in a good word for me with Violent J? Like Vampiro, I'm totally unknown in the music business, but I am a juggalo. I can complain bitterly about WCW with the best of them, and I've seen Killer Clowns from Outer Space 34 times. I want a five-album, $500,000 deal. <laughs> and then he just goes, all joking aside, when Vampiro said he was accessible to fans, it's a shoot. I was in a hotel bar after WCW Nitro a year ago. A kid rat ran past hotel, hotel security and got in the bar to get an autograph from Vamp Vampiro. When Barney Fife number two, I wonder who that was, ascertained what transpired, or well, maybe it's his assistant, he stomped into the bar, grabbed the kid, and Vamp goes, hey, lay, the, lay off the kid. It was all my fault. It was quite a cool move on Vamp's part. So anyway. What is, uh, by the way, what is a juggalo? A juggalo means you're a fan of Insane Clown Posse. Ah. Okay. Um, by the way, um, I don't know if we, we have talked about it on the show. But I thought it was I like the guy that spun the plates on the Ed Sullivan show, the juggler. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't sure. Vampiro, Vampiro is still in WCW, um, and he's uh, apparently attempting to, main, to maintain being in WCW. What? W while he's injured, after all that has gone down. Yes, it was, it's was. it been quite an entertaining week. Ay, ay, ay. That, uh, I don't know WC the wisdom of saying what was said, which I read some of, um, and then going back, and I don't know the wisdom of taking anybody back that would say what was said. Um, but that, hey, which shows hey, there may not be a lot of wisdom on either side of that relationship. I will say this for Vampiro. He has never done anything on a live broadcast television. He's done on this show. But <laughs> on a live television show, he's never gone against the script that I'm aware of. Which makes him, I won't say in the minority, but there's many guys that will be on the show tonight who have done that. One of whom is the world champion, and two others are like the world tag team champions. So that was their punishment. Um, so basically what we're saying is that WCW is a wrestling version of lowered expectations. <laughs> no, it's I don't know what it's a version of, actually. Let's go to Western Virginia. Wes, what is WCW a version of? Sure, let's do that. Not sure. Uh... I wanted to ask Jim, with all the possibility with the ECW guys coming into the WWF and with all the developmental territories, I mean, is there really going to be enough spots to, you know, the point eventually where people are going to start complaining? Like, you know, obviously WCW's got its fair share of complainers. Um, well, yeah, and, you know, two totally different environments. I don't think, I, I think there's always going to be guys saying, oh, shoot, I wish I had that spot instead of the other guy. But if there's more uh, wrestling talent in the long run, that's good for the business. And you got to remember that. Guys that would make a move now from one company to the other already have several years of experience in most cases, whereas the developmental roster, you're looking at guys that are six months, one year, two years, three years, four years maybe, uh, you know, some a little bit more but not many. Uh, those guys are, are going to be valuable in three to five years. And um, in WCW, they don't really have a talent program in place to, to – have a steady rotation, and, and the, the, the top guys age and wither on the vine without ever stepping down, and the young guys never get a break until they become old guys. So, it, you know, it's, it's two different uh, atmospheres, but I think there's always going to be competition for the... There's going to be fewer spots than there are uh, wrestlers, but as long as the competition makes those guys work a little harder, a little better, maybe a little smarter, it's going to be good in the long run. Also, I wanted to ask you, Jim, uh, an old Jim Crockett question uh what was the deal well, with i know a guy uh, an old guy named jim crockett so. <laughs> <laughs> i wanted to ask you a question though the midnight express did an angle with uh with a new breed and it was starting to get pretty good heat and all and then it got dropped like only after a couple of weeks what was the deal with that um well uh, real good reason they, they had a car wreck. Wreck about killed themselves yeah. yeah um and they pretty well weren't able to get in in the ring when they were in their hospital beds uh, no, it was it was a serious car wreck, as I recall, and I, I can't remember the individual injuries, but they were they were pretty screwed up for a while, and that's where you know we got derailed with it. It wasn't by any uh, um, you know uh, intentional means; it just happened that way because they got injured. Also, they never really that was a really weird too. Those guys came in; they they were starting to do real well, and they pretty much never heard from since. And then uh, Sean Royal's now wrestling uh, for Wildside. 
Chris Champion's bounced around Tennessee for for 10, 12 years. Yeah, Chris, Chris said uh, after the team split up, I bet Sean decided to quit quit wrestling, and I don't know whether the injuries played a part in that or not. And Chris ended up having you know various successes at various times, and, but uh, Sean just started back a little while ago, and I you know it, it may be good because he was a, a real good wrestler and he saved uh, 10 or 12 years of abuse on his body. So. Also, Jim, I wanted to ask you about uh, Chris Candido. I mean, there's a guy that you know obviously has a lot of talent. I mean, I remember seeing him even before Smoky Mountain when he was in the Northeast Independence. And, you know, he's still obviously still very young, but I mean, what do you think his future? You know, was, what happened, I guess? Was it too much, too fast, or high expectations? I don't know what happened to him. Bad, 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 bad taste in women. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of it had to do with, with both Chris and Tammy, um, you know, being younger than than most people who get to that spot, and then a combination of having their own problems and also having other people have problems around them that cause them problems. Um, and I, you know, Chris is still a young guy, and hopefully, uh, not wrestling the regular schedule that he was a while back. He's managed to save, you know, uh, heal up a little bit and save some of his body. And uh, Tammy's still a young girl, so you know, it, you can never say never. I, I don't think it's too late for them to do something. I think that uh, every time that the hierarchy somewhere that has a negative opinion of somebody passes over, as we've seen in WCW 47,000 times, um, you know, then there, somebody else is willing to give somebody a chance. Anyone and hopefully every, everybody will be able to capitalize on it next time. Right. Anyone heard how Candido's doing? Um, I've actually, Chris has called me uh, several times lately and left me messages, and I've called him and left him messages, and we haven't actually found each other personally yet, but uh, he sounds... Uh, Sounds good on the phone. <laughs> Sounds like he's happy. Okay. Anything else, Wes? That's all I had. I appreciate the comments, Jim. Thank okay, you. Okay, we'll talk to you soon, Wes. Okay, let's go to Tony in Long Island. Tony, what's going on? Hey, guys. How you doing? Doing good. Hey, I just finished reading uh, Gary Michael Capetta's book after you had uh -huh. him on the show a couple weeks ago, Dave. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really liked it. Did you get a chance to read it yet? Oh, I've read the book, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was, um, I was, I mean, I liked it. He was, I thought he was being totally straight. And when I, when I read a wrestling book, the two things that I look for is, is the guy being honest, or is the guy just blowing smoke, and the other one is, is, basically is a fun book to read. And, and his book was, I seem like, to me, like the ultimate wrestling books, for absolutely different reasons, are Dynamite Kids and Mick Foley's, okay? Um, Gary Capetta's book, I thought was as honest as any of them. I just thought that, like, you know, Mick Foley just had funnier stories. That's right. The, that, you know, but but I like the Gary Capetta book. I thought he was, you know, I is I just liked it. I see uh, Luthez has a book. Have you ever read that? Yes, uh, Luthez's book to me is a lot of fun to read, just because there's all those stories and history that has pretty much been been lost. And even though it's, you know, historically maybe not perfect, um, it when I read it, it was at the time it was the best wrestling book I had ever read. I would now yeah. go with the uh, full. I would, I would go along with that as well, just because, like you said, uh, the, the history and the stories that were lost. And, you know, you got to remember, the, the one guy dealing with his memory at the age of 80 or whatever is never going to be as historically correct as the, the people who do research because they weren't there. But you can never uh, read a story the same way as, as told by somebody that was there when nobody else was. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's why I think that that book is so valuable is because... The thing is, is you got the Luthez who who lived through and was the focal point of so much in wrestling for for 50 years, and then plus he was the best friend of Strangler Lewis, who was the number one guy, you know, going back from like in the 1920s. So you have as close to, you know, um, uh, like I guess what we call it, a secondhand version from from you know the guy who Strangler Lewis was the mentor of of that period, which is basically lost because everyone from that period is now is now gone, and and Strangler Lewis was. One of the most important people of that period. So you're not getting some some guy who was wrestling at the times version of history. You're getting like you know I mean Strangler Lewis, Billy Sandow, and um, what um, what was the other guy? Uh, Tutsman were the guys who con who controlled wrestling. So you're getting like you know from the you know you're getting what what was going on politically from the guy who was right there politically doing it as opposed to you know wrestling, especially in those days, uh, was such a secretive world that unless you got it from one of those three guys, you know you're you're just getting speculation because in those days. I mean, literally, I mean, the boys didn't know which matches were works or shoots unless they were the two guys in the ring. I mean, that's how it was. Yeah, but how honest do you think those guys were? I mean, imagine a book that Vince McMahon would write. Okay, you're, 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 you're right. I don't know that they're any more honest, but it's, it's, it's probably about as good as we're going to get. And you know, I you're think, right. I think, you know, when I read Fez's book, just judging from stories that I've heard from people that I would consider, you know, to be uh, 
knowledgeable in that area and just getting the flavor and knowing the flavor of the business, I think a lot of it's credible. Of course, you'll notice in Lou's book, and God bless Lou says, I think he's a wonderful human being, everybody comes up and introduces themselves to Lou, whether it be Bob Hope or the president or whoever. Lou never knows anybody. <laughs> everybody comes up to Lou. But you know what? I'll trade that for the, uh, for the stories. They're fabulous. You know, some of that I would almost disagree with, though, because even if you, even if you like, see China or anybody going on Jay Leno or whatever show, they'll always bring up that same 14 million voters, and they'll always talk about 93,000 fans at WrestleMania, and it's the Vince McMahon story, and they've all heard it so many times that they just have come to believe it. That's the Well, there's, there's, there's a, certainly in, from that era, we're never going to get the whole truth because for the, for, the, for the two reasons. Number one, everyone's dead. And number two, even if they were alive, um, they were so steeped in that carny tradition that they would never tell the, the, the truth. So this is, this is about the best we can get of it. I don't know. Yeah, it's not even so the, much the, people being dishonest, just them hearing a lie so many times that all of a sudden they just decide it's the truth. You know what's funny yeah, but, about but that? A guy like Fizz was there the first time it was told. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in some in some cases, but you know, Brian, the one good thing about that is, 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 and this is really sad, but that's actually what history is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I was younger, I didn't know that, but like, I think that that's probably like that in in like everything. all forms of it. In yeah. everything, in everything, like certain things that whether they're true or not, when they get told enough, they become you know, like in the the history books of like uh, you know World War II or certainly like. Uh, you know the the Declaration of Independence and all those stories. They're probably all about as accurate as as um, ninety three thousand people at the Silver you know, Dome. I, I heard I heard that they really exaggerated the pop for the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> <laughs> hey Jim, I want to ask you a couple questions about uh, NWA in uh, the mid eighties. Uh huh. I've been uh, over the last year or two. I've seen a ton of tapes, and I tell you, uh, I would put that up with uh, just about any wrestling um, over the last 20, 25 years as far as I think that was some of the greatest wrestling uh, TV shows. You know, watching the WWF, they always have had the knack for the for the big the spectacle, the big pay-per-view shows, the WrestleManias, but I think those TV shows were as good as any shows we've ever seen, like I said, over the last 20, 25 years. Well, I, I think that at that time, the, the guys in the NWA had taken uh, wrestling about as far as they could to the edge and still make it uh, the believable wrestling as opposed to crossing the line into sports entertainment and standing there waiting for the guy to come from 40 feet away. I think that may be where it passed, and it's like you couldn't really go any farther without uh, changing the, the concept of it. So that, that's why I, I really enjoyed you know, the, those matches. What uh, baby doll with the uh, four horsemen, whose idea was it to put her even on TV? Dusty Rhodes loved baby doll. <laughs> My little Marilyn Monroe. Uh-huh. My little Marilyn Monroe. So <laughs> Dusty loved baby doll, and henceforth, all the fans loved baby doll. It was amazing how it worked. <laughs> <laughs> and let me ask you, I might be going out on a limb here, but... Uh, being that Jim Crockett owned the promotion, would that be why we had to listen to David Crockett? Yes, yes. Well, you know, <laughs> some people suspicion that at one time, but but David's David's uh, pristine voice and and clear you know clear commentary over the many years uh, proved everybody wrong. Jim, I gotta ask. Her. Okay, he's this got him by the honker. He's got him by the honker, kicking like a dog. You know that was basically <laughs> David's David thing. <laughs> And, uh, you know, all the guys, whenever you had to do an interview with him, I mean, you could have stood there and you could have either blown sardine breath in his face or you could have farted up his nose, and he would have that same look on his face. And, we, we, uh, you know, we, it, was, uh, we, it was interesting. We got, ahead, we got ahead to a break, but there's one thing I... Did you ever get any heat? Because this was one of the funniest lines I ever heard in wrestling was when um, you were just... It's this, like, like this throwaway line. David Crockett said something stupid, and you'll probably remember what it is. I don't remember off the top of his head. And you just came back with... That's, see what happens when the fetus doesn't get enough oxygen. <laughs> Actually, I don't remember what David said because you, you couldn't clarify it enough for just saying when he said something stupid. I really couldn't make the choice. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, no, actually, he, ever, he always took everything in stride except the one day on Atlanta TV he got kind of uh, ticked off at me because I said, uh, you know, Sweet Stan was available, right? So I said Madonna and Sean Penn just got a divorce, so... Sweet Stan could be Madonna's next Sean. I said, Joan Collins and Peter Holm got a divorce, so Sweet Stan could be Joan Collins' next Peter. <laughs> David didn't like that. <laughs> I want to make mention of two things before we get back to the phone calls. This has to do with the shows on, I think it was Friday's show. Anyway, the caller on your show today, you said the WCW versus New, New Japan pay-per-view was...
Starcade 96 was wrong. It was, in fact, Starcade 95, which is what I thought. Because I was all confused when he said it was 96. Anyway, Starcade 96 was headlined by Hulk Hogan against Roddy Piper, but there was a decent opening match between Malenko and Ultimo Dragon. As I recall, that was much better than decent. I think that match was, like, phenomenal. <laughs> this is from Justin Crass, who was talking about the, the book Frank Gotch, American Hero. Mike Chapman's newest book on Frank Gotch is much like you said. It was good for chronological historical data, but terrible for truthful historical insight. It's a historical novel, not a, not a straight biography, so it's told in story format. Chapman completely blows off any negative points of Gotch's career. Gotch's loss to Tom Jenkins is barely mentioned and only done so to put over his final win over Tom Jenkins. Similarly, Gotch's loss to Fred Beal isn't mentioned at all, only in a passing reference to point out that it happened to be his last loss. Regarding Fred Beal and the 1990, 1911 Hackenschmidt matches, Chapman portrays both matches as total shoots and has Gotch even say in the book something effective, yeah, people think I work those matches, but I'm far above doing something like that. Chapman also portrays Jenkins as being the dirty wrestler in his matches with Gotch, even though all the other evidence points to the opposite, like, gouch, like Gotch gouging Jenkins' fake eye, which is never mentioned in the book. <laughs> in the end, the book is very good for tracking Gotch's career. Insight into the pre, his pre-media icon status is very useful, as is his relationship with boxer Jim Johnson and his personal life, although I'm doubtful how straight Gotch was, no matter how Chapman writes writes him as. So, anyway, so, so basically you had a kind of an all-American uh, nice guy fella that says that he doesn't like to throw matches and you had another uh, evil dirty wrestler that was trying to cheat him. wonder where all this <laughs> stuff got started. <laughs> uh, in the 1880s, I think. <laughs> Some, somewhere in there. I, I read this one to you. I guess I bet, just, just... I bet Gotch, was, uh, Gotch was spinning in his grave when Toots Mont got the credit for inventing the finish. <laughs> Well, so those guys uh, in the 1880s were doing that, like the original Strangler Lewis. I remember reading something. There was some like article from like the 1880s, and it was about a Strangler Lewis match with somebody, not, not Evan Strangler Lewis, and it was just talking about how um, you know he, he had he hadn't lost in eight years, and he was coming to some city, and and the newspaper was basically saying, well, this is what the result of the match is going to be. This guy's going to win the first fall. This guy's going to win the second fall. And it was like they're giving the results ahead of time of a of a match. This is in the 1880s, and like. Some people will insist that, like, you know, wrestling was all in the up and up until, you know, I 1920. Vince invented the finish. <laughs> Vince invented everything. <laughs> 1984, he invented, he invented wrestling. And then in 1988. I thought that was Vince Russo. <laughs> he reinvented it. <laughs> he reinvented it and nearly killed it. Oh, yeah, that's, but that's like when that guy made that square wheel. You know, I was talking about, uh, you were talking earlier about Bischoff. Yeah. <laughs> Bischoff buying WCW now, you know, I'm not saying that this is the case. Obviously, it's not because these are all, you know, uh, well-known, uh, world-respected businessmen involved, not shysters and con men and carnies. But one of the oldest tricks in the old-time wrestling business was to get the book and get some pull in a territory and run that sucker all the way down to where it was about to go down the drain and then buy it from the poor beleaguered promoter for a song and then pop it back up. But, you know, I think that, uh, you know, sometimes people learn to kill the thing too well. Well, you know what the, 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 the thing on this one is? Is that I think one of the reasons, seriously, why this deal hasn't gone through is because I think that there's people at TBS who, they may not know those exact stories that, that you know, <laughs> but, they know but they know versions of them from other businesses, and they don't want to be the poor, beleaguered sucker who sells it back to this guy because he's the one who killed it in the first place. And so that's why I think they really, like, that's, I think that's one of the reasons why this deal keeps getting stalled and why they... You know, they did so much serious negotiation with Vince McMahon. Well, and, and also, those are just old wrestling stories. Nothing like that would ever really happen in real life. <laughs> this is from Kevin Blackwell, who said something. They could at least fire get... Russo, just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> what you think? Well, but, but that's like one of those fires where it's like, okay, just uh, sit home, we'll send you the check, you're fired, and I'll tell you when to come back. back. Yeah, they did that one, too. I'll tell you what. The, the thing when they, when they brought when they brought him back, that one really scared me, because it's like at the beginning, you know, it's like you know he had a good line and everything, and I mean, except for except for Jim Cornette and um, about five other people who actually were at the meetings with him and knew what he did and what Vince McMahon did. I mean, the rest of us just had to take Russo's word for it, and you know, you yeah, the, you know, the company went way up during that period, and the other company went way down, and I can see you know I could see why they hired him, but about you know what it was? It was during that World Title Tournament when Russo. You know, put that World Title Tournament, and they, there was um, 31 matches in this tournament. This was like going on October, November of last year, and every single one of them had like a million run-ins. And of the 31 matches, I think only two of them were good, and they both involved Benoit. At that point, I realized that um, 
that, that somehow or other this thing wasn't living up to its potential. I started getting worried. And then that day when uh, when he decided he was going to have a battle royal to make a world champion and put it on Tank Abbott as world champion, I realized, and that was the same day, by the way, that Russo got fired the first time, well, that you know, he just didn't have it. The, the story is this little kid goes in the blacksmith shop and Smith says, Now, son, now don't touch nothing in here. I'm warning you, don't screw nothing up, you can get hurt. And the blacksmith has the horseshoe, and he's got it all in the fire, and he's got it all red hot and everything, fixing to bend it. He sets it down for a second, turns his back, and the kid grabs the horseshoe and, whoo, throws it up in the air. And the guy said, see there, I told you not to, hurt, to touch nothing, you might get hurt. And he said, no, it just don't take me long to look at a horseshoe. If it was WCW and Russo, WCW would have picked that horseshoe Russo up and put it in their back pocket and be sitting on it for three days before they realized it shouldn't take them very long to look at a horseshoe. Let's go to Dimitri in Albany. Dimitri, what's up? Hey, Jim. Hey. Uh, did you try to bring Abdul the Butcher into WWF when you were there? That's yeah. right. Somebody asked that the other day. Um, did I want to? Yeah. Yes. I thought uh, when when uh, uh, Mick came in that, that it would be fabulous to do something with him. And uh, yeah, this was one of, the, of my first bones of contention with Russo because I... Uh, I think I suggested Abdullah in a box, and later on I had Terry Funk in a box. Because you know what? It's a rule of thumb in wrestling. The guy that comes out of the box gets over. I'm sorry, but, you know, that's the way it is. The guy that comes out of the box gets over. But at any rate, I had, I had suggested Abdullah, but uh, uh, it never came to pass. Uh, uh, that you think there is, like, a place for him today in wrestling? Uh, Abdullah? Yeah. Uh, Dave, if I'm not mistaken, he still wrestles, doesn't he? Yeah, Big Japan. Uh, yeah. I mean, probably, so. probably just some Indies. Oh, not again! Go, 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 go! Kill him, kill him! Uh, no, we had a rule. We have a, we have a, yeah, what, what is that rule? No banging pots no and pans? No banging pots on the air. What the heck was that? That's, that's right. All right, let's go to Chris in Long Island. And I know you're going to have a more intelligent question than, than the last guy. Hello? Chris! I swear I knew he would. See you. Chris, what's... Hello? Chris, what's going on? Oh, yeah, hi, I'm sorry. Um... I, was, I have a couple questions for Mr. Clinette and a couple for you if I can. Um, first, I just wanted to ask him about uh, his, his time managing Vader. Uh, just in general, what was he like to work with, and uh, did he foresee him ever getting another shot in uh, America again? Um, well, I liked managing uh, Vader. I thought, you know, he was a great talent. He was one of the, the best big men in the history of the business. He had, unfortunately, he got uh, sidetracked really when he got started in the WWF because he was coming off of a, uh, he wasn't even coming off of it. He had a shoulder injury made his debut and then had to take uh, some time off to get the shoulder operated on. His weight went up. And uh, so I don't think that the WWF actually got Vader like Vader could be Vader. Uh, also, too, I don't know if you've ever addressed this publicly. If you even want to, if you don't, that's fine. Um, New Jack from ECW has a, a shoot interview that he did a while ago where he has some comments about you as far as he, he calls you a racist and this and that. Do you have anything to say about that or have you ever... <laughs> have you? Are you now, or have you ever been a member of the racist party? Um, <laughs> no, New, New Jack's problems were basically whether he was black, blue, green, orange, or, or polka dotted. Um, New Jack got to be a star way too quick. Um, unfortunately, he got to be a star before anybody else even knew he was a star. And um, New Jack has a lot of opinions about a lot of things, but I think the the record speaks for itself in the fact that the guy that made it out of that team that was in Smoky Mountain, New Jack and Mustafa and D'Lo, was D'Lo because D'Lo actually used that opportunity to be in Smoky Mountain and, and to, to work with the guys that he worked with to learn what he was doing and to learn how to get along and to, to perfect uh, his craft instead of worrying about uh, how famous he was or how much money he made or, or who said this or that about him. And uh, so D'Lo's the one that you see now on television, and New Jack's the one you see falling off balconies near you. Okay, and lastly, since you uh, also worked with this guy, and everybody likes to, to tell stories about him, everybody likes to hear him, uh, do you have any good uh, Owen Hart prank stories or anything that, that maybe nobody's talked about oh, uh, that has made it public that you could just... Well, so, so many people have, have told stories about Owen. I don't think Owen's pulled any joke that hadn't been retold, but they, they were all fun. I mean, Owen was just... It, it, it wasn't like he... Hello? Hello? Uh, I had a problem with my phone. Ah, so. It wasn't like he would spend three days setting something up. It was like he was just always into something. I mean, even if it was standing there doing, you know, interviews on TV and he had his water bottle and he was squirting me and Davy Boy in the crotch so it looked like we'd wet ourselves on television. You know, he's just always into something, and that's why he was always fun to be around. Okay. Um, as for, for Dave, I just had a couple questions about the, uh, the pay-per-view yesterday. Or one sure. question, actually, about the pay-per-view. Uh, do you think the reason that the main event really didn't have the heat that it should have had was because it followed that Tajiri uh, Woodburn tag match? 
because there were so many spots and I thought the crowd just went nuts for them. There was nothing really that, as hard as they worked and as good as they were, there was nothing that really those three guys did or really could do that was along the same lines that I think got the, the crowd is into it. I think it was just a bad match to kind of follow right after I think you want to really see Sandman. Partially, you know, I think part partially, it was just a weird crowd. You know, Paul Heyman is late as that, that morning, because I actually talked to him very briefly that morning, and he was debating back and forth which match to put on last, who was going to put the um, the tag team title or the three-way. And uh, he was leaning towards the three-way because it was the world title and the idea that you put the world title on last. But he he kind of knew that it was going to be tough to follow the, the, the tag team match. And I don't know. The I think that the problem was is that the matches went, a lot of the matches went long. And it was a crowd. I mean, every match after the 10-minute mark, the crowd wasn't into. It was just, you know, um... I think it's partially the thing. You know, Brian's right. You know, because the fact is, it isn't even the time. I mean, the first minute of that match, those guys were out there. Lynn and um, Lynn and Credible were out there doing some really good wrestling yeah. right away, and the crowd's going, "We want Sandman, we want Sandman." And right then, I go, "You know, these guys are going to have a real hard time." I knew it right away. And then when they, as the more the match went on, it was like they were having an even harder time. I and I was just feeling, I was just feeling sorry for them. Yeah, they're going to have a hard time too because I was listening to the law earlier, and uh, from what the you were on it also, you know, yesterday. Um, and they were talking about how the crowd really didn't... I mean, they weren't really sure who to be behind it. I think it's because... I think, I mean, Credible's supposed to be a heel, and I guess, you know, Linda's supposed to be a face, but with Carino in it, it was kind of weird because Carino was, like, so in between, and I don't think they knew one way or another, like, who, like, if they even three, knew who they wanted three, to win the title, or if, you know what I mean? All three, all three guys were in between, and that's why they wanted Sandman. And they, want, they wanted Sandman in the match because he was in the main event the time before, and he's the only one that was a clear-cut baby face because Lynn, everyone knows, is turning, plus they were mad at him because they thought he was leaving. Carino's a tweener, and Credible is supposed to be a heel, but he's a New York guy, and the match is in New York, so the fans half wanted to like him. So, you know, that's it created this three guys that they didn't really care greatly one way or the other about. Sounds like a clear-cut case of excellent matchmaking to me. <laughs> uh, lastly, if, is it time for one more question? Sure, go ahead. Okay, um, when you were talking about the old timers and stuff earlier and the way they kind of protect the business still, I was listening to a couple of interviews um, with guys like George Steele and um, um, Steve Blasi. And is it, have you ever, is it frustrating for you when you like talk to them? Because I was listening to some of the interview and they would be giving stories and, and a lot of good stories about things, and then they'll talk about their matches as if they were real matches when they obviously weren't and talk about, I messed around and he beat me, or that night, I, you know, he was tough, but I beat him, or I got beat, and this and, that. and they talk like it was a real match, and is that, like, frustrating for you when you're trying to do an interview, and, like, how do you just, like, handle that? Do you just, do you just, do you let them know beforehand that you... Let, 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 me, let, me, let me ask you a question, and, sure. and then we'll let Dave answer that after, uh, from the other side of it. Did you ever look at it like, let's say, for example, you're a baseball reporter, a sports reporter, and you get the chance to talk to Babe Ruth or Mickey Mantle or Joe DiMaggio, and they exaggerate their game Aren't a little they all bit dead? too, but at the same time, <laughs> you sit there and you just love being yeah. in the presence of guys who actually made history, and you listen to the stories and have fun and, and yeah, don't that's... worry about whether they're being all together honest about their performance. Yeah, I, I definitely see that was the reason. I mean, if I mean, if I was talking to somebody and they were doing that, no, I'm not going to correct them or anything. But I mean, like before the interview, do they? That, actually, I think you should. I think any time you talk to Freddie Blassie, you should correct him. He tells you a story that. That, no, he didn't really win that match. And he didn't really <laughs> bump that guy on the head. And 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 then come back after the first time you do it and let me know how it went. <laughs> it was it was an interesting interview, but he talked about all of his matches like they were shoots and everybody, you know. That that, that you know uh, to be honest, that that's how they all grew up, and it takes a long time to get that. And and you'll find even with the active wrestlers that are in their forties that grew up with that mentality, it's very very difficult. Even for Jim, for Jim, it's very difficult in certain circumstances to do that. And for younger guys, you know, they were taught differently, so it's a it's just a different, it's a different mentality in a different world. We got a ton of emails to get to. I want to get to a couple of these and we'll get back to the phone lines. Um, the problem with that Starcade, <laughs> this is just so, this is so silly, but it's actually pretty funny. Um, the the Starcade '95 uh, with the uh, New Japan WCW, um, what was it called? What did they call that? The International, the World Cup of Wrestling? Is that what they called it? I forget the name. Where it was the show where uh, Shinjiro Tani wrestled Eddie Guerrero and um, Sting wrestled Kensuke Sasaki. Um, which was Starcade '95. It was released on WCW Home Video under the name Starcade '96, and that's why there was a. That's why everyone is confused about that. Okay, uh, let's see. Are there any websites I can order Gary Capetta and Dynamite Kids book? Uh, Gary Capetta's www.bodyslams.com. Dynamite Kids book. I think you could probably get it at uh, 
Live audio, you know, www.liveaudiowrestling.com. Uh, let's see. Um, Jim, are you there? My butt kicked if I don't mention our website. Uh, because okay. Clark and Pam Patterson, who who have CP Graphics here in Louisville, do our website. They are relaunching it soon. It's very near with the all new stuff. I don't know what the term is, but it's going to be new. Redesign. And, uh, they, they will. Uh, they're putting up a bunch of new graphics and stuff, but they do a great job. It's ovwrestling.com, and that way you can also buy videotapes, which is the most important thing when you go there. Can you hear us both now? Say again. Uh, see if Dave can hear me. Uh, hello. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? No, no I can, yeah. we knocked everybody okay. off the air. There we go. Okay. Uh, do you mind asking Jim his thoughts on his series of matches in 1996 with Jose Lothario? Uh, that was that was fun, actually. I about died because I was uh, had not been wrestling, and, and especially was not used to wrestling on those WWF rings, which were like concrete at that point. And um, I was I was challenged to, to fall down a lot at, a, at an advanced weight, um, but it was fun because I loved just being in the ring with Jose. Uh, you know, he was a, a tremendous worker, and he could throw a punch that would just graze off the end of your nose, and it looked like it tore your head off, which I especially enjoyed, rather than the, you know, the other choice, which would be tearing my head off. You know, why did it take the WWF so long to design new rings? Um, I th the rings that they had, it was just a case of, you know, do what you've always done. Um, the rings that they had were good for the for the Hogans and the Andres and the... The big guys that, that, you know, weren't flying off the top rope and, and taking a lot of bumps, but, you know, it was murder on the smaller guys, and it was, you know, murder on everybody who was in there bumping and working hard. So they, they you know, gradually redesigned those things, and it's a whole lot easier on the guys' bodies now. Uh, let's see, this is from Henry who goes, uh, I recently watched Beyond the Mat, and you were giving advice to Mike Modest and Tony Jones from All Pro Wrestling. I was wondering what you thought of those two guys, and did anyone in the WF ever steal Modest's finisher? Um, actually, to my knowledge, I don't think so. Um, I, I like I like Mike. I think he's a very good technical wrestler. I told him uh, a while back when we talked that his problem was that he didn't have huge size or a weird appearance or anything that stands out. Otherwise, than being like an you know an Arn Anderson, somebody who's all around good at what they do, um, and it was going to take him longer as a result of that to to be able to catch on. And and Tony, I thought was good as well. And you know that that scene in the movie. That was the one thing that I did. They were always, you know, I wasn't in agreement with uh, having a camera behind the scenes in the locker room in the wrestling business. Just, you know, it gave me gas. So I voted them for about six months, and they asked me to do one thing, and that was it. And I figured, well, if anything in the world will ever end up on the cutting room floor, it'll be this. So I'll do it. They'll shut up, and I'll go on. And son of a gun, they put it in the movie. <laughs> so you never know. This is from Nick who goes, in your opinion, who is the most overrated person in the wrestling business today? Oh Sable. gosh, um, Sable's not in the business this week. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, overrated. I mean, you know, there's there's a, a lot of choices for that, unfortunately, and they're generally all making a lot of money. Um, you know, uh, the, the Kevin Nashes of the world, who you mentioned before, for obvious reasons. Um, you know, th there's a lot of guys, especially down there, uh, that that don't work nearly as hard for their dollar as the guys who are are better equipped and and uh, have shown more talent and have shown more devotion, but unfortunately haven't, uh, for some reason, been given the ball to carry in the past. So it'd be unfair to all these crooks to single out just one. You know, there's one thing. I actually wanted to bring this up. you got you got a guy on, on your roster, and you talked about him a little bit earlier, Leviathan, Dave Batista. And, and you know, there's one thing about him that's, that's because of his look, because he's so big and so muscular and everything like that, and, and, and I was thinking about like you know the whole makeup of a wrestling card. He would be, as far as like, if he were to go to the WWF, and he were to be uh, in that in that lower card level, first match, second match guy, it would be a total disaster. But as a main eventer, he might catch on. And I think that there's there's something, and I almost see there's another problem with WCW in that they're trying to fill their roster up. You know, and this what I say by this is when you look at the power plant, you know, they they have all these huge steroided up guys, okay. And they all, you know, you know, big and strong, and and some of them can do some very good athletic moves. But to me, I think that you need you need the workers to go along with those guys if you're going to have a a good promotion. I think that exactly, you know, you, you, know, you, you can't have, you can't have, have all those guys against each Indians, other from the opening the match. Surgeons. You have all all types of of styles and all different kinds of matches, and and so 
for example, on the card on the 13th, Leviathan is, is wrestling Kane, which is, you know, two movie monsters in action. And then you've got Chris Benoit against Nick Dinsmore, where they can, can stretch each other and show uh, their talents in their particular style. I think you got to do that. And, and you know, Leviathan is, is so impressive. If you send him out in a first or second match environment to uh, to go eight or nine minutes with um, with somebody maybe 50 pounds lighter and do a bunch of arm drags and, and monkey flips, then it, it, it doesn't get over. It doesn't get, you know, they're looking at this guy going, geez, he's, you know, he ought to be able to kill this guy. It doesn't add up. So you got to be able to, to send a guy like Leviathan who, who is down here, he's doing the same kind of drills in class. He's doing the same kind of moves that everybody else does, but there's some things because of his look he shouldn't do. It's not that he can't, it's just that he shouldn't. These other guys that, that we were talking about, there's things they can't do that they should be doing, but they can't do. There's a big difference there, so I, I think Leviathan's going to be ready to do whatever once he gets there. He'll be able to do whatever the guy in the ring with him wants to do and can do, but he'll know the difference in the things that he shouldn't do. Uh, on the, this is, this is a regard, uh, I, I guess this, the basic, this basic question is, uh, for people who do not read the sheets, and in fact, even if you do read the sheets, you wouldn't know this, what is, basically, you and Mark Madden, where did it start? Because I got, I got to tell you a story. Who was it? Who was it that I was talking? Oh, 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 oh! I, I, I got to tell this story. And you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. I'm this sure actually, I will. This, this is actually a Mark Madden story, and this was during the period where they thought that uh, WWF was going to buy WCW. Remember that couple week period? Right. And the rumor was that Jim Ross was going to be in charge, and you know, of course, Mark Madden flipped because you know Mark Madden and Jim Ross. Okay, there's, there's heat there, and. This, I was not in this conversation, but somebody called me up and said that they had a conversation with Mark Madden, and and it was about and they go, Mark, um, what is exactly what is it that um, that you hate so much about Jim Ross? And he was going like, God, I don't even it's been so many years I don't even remember anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, because that's the whole thing comes from what did he make up to write about Jim Ross to please Eric Bischoff when he first got the job on the hotline. You know, that's basically where it comes down to. The heat that he has with every human being in the world, which is every right, upstanding, forthright young Christian man, should hate Mark Madden just on the uh, general principle of it, the big fat piece of, you know. But uh, the thing is, is that the, the reason why he has heat with so many people is because when he first got that job on the uh, WCW 900 number and being the classic jock sniffer that he is and never, never able to do anything in the business physically, he wanted to cement his position by, in effect, giving... Uh, uh, verbal oral gratification to Eric Bischoff by knocking anybody that Bischoff didn't like. So if he couldn't find anything truthful about him, then he had to make stuff up, and that's where that heat comes from, with me, with JR, with anybody else that uh, basically wants to pound the bejesus out of Madden anytime they see him. He's a liar. This is, this is, a, que this is a question this is from Kevin Curra, and um, I'm going to say, um, I already know the answer to it, but you can explain it. Because uh, do you miss being part of the WF on a day-to-day -day basis, or do you enjoy being a part of the developmental territory more? Oh, you know, and, and once again, it's not that I didn't like the people in the WWF, but the choice of living in Louisville against living in Connecticut and, and working with these guys and doing what I'm doing now, there's there's no contest, especially because I'm nowhere near the George Washington Bridge. <laughs> what do you have against that bridge? I, just, I remember that bridge Did last time I was there. that bridge. <laughs> oh, well, what? One of these days, maybe they when they repave it and the, and the Honda Civic start, uh, stop falling through to the river, it, it would be a little easier to travel. Now, i got a question. This is, this, is, this is a theoretical. It has to do with wrestling in a sense. Brian and I have actually discussed this. If you were on a bridge and somebody threw you over, okay, would it make a difference if they did it face-to-face -face or behind your back? <laughs> And that actually does relate quite well to wrestling. Um, actually, I don't think it makes much difference, but it would be it would be a lot nicer if they'd shake your hand on the way over. Because <laughs> we were just wondering when the Rock when the Rock talked about throwing Stone Cold off the bridge. You just love that line where at just least goes, it was face to face. <laughs> and he goes, "When I threw him off the bridge, at least it was face to face." <laughs> But you know that that's 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 not only a, a good promo line, but also it's it's very uh, allegorical to the wrestling industry as a whole. <laughs> Let's go to Steve in New York. Steve, what's going on? Um, I was at the um, the Hammerstein last night for the pay per view, and uh -huh. um, I just had a few things to comment on. Mm -hmm. The main event, the crowd was quite dead. Um, and, and 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 what was your what was your feeling as to why? Um, well, the cheer, the crazy Chijiri Whipwreck Kid match stole all the heat. All the thunder was gone, and there were flashers in the crowd. 
which is like everything you always say between matches, and there were flashes in the crowds that took away all the heat. Um, with Sandman, on an ECW pay-per-view, every moment that goes by where Sandman is not there is another moment that you know he's going to be there, and he's going to come through the crowd with that song playing, and he's going to drink beer. So the more he's not there, the more they anticipate it. And by the end of the show, they were frenzied for him. They really just wanted him out there. Um, what did they do once they got him? Uh, well, considering the fact I rushed up there, too, and I consider myself a total um, biased smart, and I got crushed by a 1,000 people rushing up to him, too. Uh, yeah, we just posed behind him, and we screamed. So once we got him, we swarmed him. <laughs> you bring him out there. <laughs> and you kicked him like a dog. <laughs> um, also, in ECW, because there's obviously no Titantron, um, and all the interviews for the pay-per-view are backstage, and they don't have... TV, a lot of the fans, they literally had no idea what the storylines were, but they were still going to the pay-per-view, so they had no idea what some of the matches were, and because there's no interviews out in the ring, and there's no build-up in the ring, there was no build-up for any of the matches, so like, we used to, we would sit there, and we're like, okay, what's next, and then some alternate, alternative rap music would play and be like, I think I remember who has this music. <laughs> Because, you know, you, you can play that for, after about three hours, all that heavy rock music that they play as their entrances, it starts to blend together after a while. No. Yeah, it, we really, it's like, who is this? Um, until they, like, peek their head through that curtain, we have no idea who's coming out. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, there's no you know, one, Yeah, one of the things is, 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 is Heyman kept a lot of the, the card secret. Um, I mean, like, there were four or five matches. That's a good promotional strategy. You know what was, what was really weird is that um, in the match which we were talking about, which was the match that to me stole the show, which was Tajiri and Mikey, Mikey Whipwreck against Super Crazy and Kid Cash, the, all of the advertising, even, I mean, all of it to the last minute was um, Super Crazy and a mystery partner. Now, if it's Kid Cash, who's a regular guy on your roster, who's a good worker, who's actually an excellent worker, and, and if you told people... Kid Cash was going to be the partner. I don't think it would have hurt the match because people were looking for Wow, that's a great match. And then with the mystery partner, I mean, I guess... Well, weren't they you know, keeping it, that open in case Rob Van Dam decided to work the pay-per-view? Just in yeah, case? He, perhaps well, he... set people up to think that, too, that it might be Cash. Hall. Everyone in that audience. Every single person Scott in that Hall. audience. Down to the girls who came with their boyfriends. Knew that everyone was Kid knew, Cash. Everyone knew it was going to be Kid Cash? Absolutely everyone knew that was Kid Cash. Well, I'll okay. tell you what, speaking as a person who, who runs shows on a fairly regular basis, I'm going to try to adopt that strategy and try to keep all of my lineup secret from now on on the theory that people <laughs> will come wondering what they're going to view. <laughs> there, was, um, there was once a meeting in WCW. It was with the Japanese, because I actually heard it from one of the Japanese side guys. And, and, and uh, one of the guys who was running the company at the time was getting real mad that that some of the house show lineups were getting in the newsletter because they were being advertised in the city, right? And they were going like, wait a minute, if they're just printing the lineups, uh, I mean, these weren't like secret lineups months ahead talking about turns that hadn't happened and stuff like that, which I have done in the past what as well. They're advertising in Dubuque, right? Right, and they were going like, it's because they're advertising the house show lineups and they're thinking like, well, let's see, what, and, and that's a bad thing? Damn their eyes. <laughs> yeah. Also, in the main event, besides Sandman, like you said before, we had no idea who to cheer for. I, I've been watching hardcore TV every week leading up to this, and they Carino started out as a face, and they're trying to turn him into a whiny heel again. Yeah, that's right. I watch hardcore TV. I mean, they're trying to make him a tweener, and then um, it, it's just really the really weird storylines. They're not very focused, and then Lynn Lynn is a baby face that they're obviously in the midst of turning heel. Or we, actually, we thought he was going to WWF if he lost tonight. So when he lost that that first pinfall. Every, the reason we chanted, um, you sold out, we really thought that he had, um, he had yeah. signed a contract with, like, WCW. Oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't chant that at him, though. I know, I know. Oh, damn, damn this thing about proving the allegation. <laughs> Let's just chant. <laughs> well, ECW, yeah, but even if when, when you're an ECW show, you abandon, um, all sensibility, I would say, because we were chanting, we were chanting Mountain Dew during a match for some reason. Like, at one point, we weren't, it was, had nothing to do with the show. Because I was trying to figure out what those chants were. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what that chant was. That's what that chant was. That was wrestling. 
Oh, my God. We, we are totally out of time. we got to get running now. Jim, I want to thank you very much. Real quick, plug, plug that website. Uh, OVWrestling.com. You can find out all about December 13th. Okay, and uh, good luck with the show December 13th. I want to thank everyone for calling in. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Mike. And we'll see you tomorrow at 6.